Okay, so as uh, Bill uh, mentioned, uh, we expect there will be eight hours of lecture this week on this uh, topic of uh, A packets. And the way we are doing it is I will take the first two hours and then uh, Hiraku will take the next two hours tomorrow and so on. Okay. Um, so for, for today, I, uh, I will be using slides, okay? but uh, if I'm not wrong, the slides will actually be uploaded onto the conference web page. Maybe it has already been uploaded. I don't know. So I think there's no need to take any notes. Anyhow, it will be quite impossible to take notes on this slide, as you will see. Okay? Um, anyhow, my, my goal is to cover some, uh, some broad global view of things and to leave the remaining six hours on the more details. Okay? And uh, hopefully this will provide uh, uh, just a background and uh, notations and so on uh, for the other lecture courses as well. Okay, so uh, the question we want to talk about is uh, what are A packets? Well, uh, I guess uh, to give to formulate an answer, I mean it depends on who the audience is, right? If you haven't even heard of the word A packets before, uh, of course you may ask, what is it? Is it a bag of apples, okay, or a bag of bananas? Okay, no. If it is bananas, it probably be called B packets, right? So, well, uh, well, the A stands for Arthur, I guess. Okay. So, what are Arthur packets? Uh, let, let, me, let us start with some notations. So F is a local field for, for, in, of characteristic zero for convenience. For example, QP or real numbers. Uh, let G be a, a connected reductive group over F. Uh, for this lecture, I'll just, you just pretend that it is split all the time. Uh, that will simplify life. And uh, that's considered a set of irreducible uh, smooth representations of G. Representations are always over complex numbers, okay, so on complex vector space. And uh, we are considering it up to equivalence. Okay. And finally, I consider the subset of uh, unitarizable or unitary representations. Okay, so those are the basic notations. And uh, with that, we can, we can give a first level answer to the question, what are A packets? Okay. They are not a bag of apples. Okay? An A packet is a finite multi-set of elements of irreducible representations of G. Okay, what is the word multi means? It means that um, it, each element of the set could come with a multiplicity. So for example, you can take a certain irreducible unitary representation two times. Okay, so that's an answer. In some sense, I've answered this question, but maybe, uh, of course, uh, it, sh it should itself lead to more questions. Of course, you'll ask, like, so what are these finite sets of unitary representations for? Why, why do we bother to put them into finite, certain finite subsets? How are they defined? I mean, clearly, it's not some random collection of unitary representations. How are they defined or characterized? And finally, how are they constructed? So the purpose of this course is to address some of these questions. Okay, but we'll start with an easier one. What are L packets? Okay. The only thing I've done is replace A by L. Why would that make it easier? Well, uh, it is because uh, L packets are designed to solve a very natural problem. Okay, what is the problem? Well, we have our group G, right? And we have the set of irreducible representations up to equivalence. So, of course, if you study representation theory, the, one of the you agree that the basic question is to classify the irreducible representations. Okay. And that's what the local Langlands correspondence uh, is uh, concerns. Okay, okay so, um, so let's state the conjectural answer. Okay. How do you classify irreducible representations of, for example, a p adic uh, group or a real Lie group? Okay, so there are two statements. Okay, statement one uh, is that there is a subjective finite to one map uh, let me call it script L, from the set of irreducible representations uh, to a certain target space. Okay, the map is subjective with finite fibers. Uh, what is this target? Um, I'm going to just say it first and I'll explain in the following slides. So the target phi G is the set of equivalence classes of L parameters for G. Uh, so of course, you see, if this map, if the fibers were singleton, then you, you'll be bijective. Okay, if it's bijective, then you can think of the target as a parameterization of uh, this set of irreducible representations we are interested in classifying. Okay. Um, now, of course, the, the map should satisfy a number of properties because, of course, if you have one such map, you can 
fool around with it and produce many others. Okay, so, of course, this map should have good properties, uh, and hopefully this property should characterize it uniquely. And we will come, we will discuss this in the following slides. Uh, but anyhow, at the moment, we postulate that there is such a subjective finite to one map, and the fibers of this map are the so-called L packets. <laughs> so that defines L packet for you. Um, so if you give me an element in the target, uh, I have an so you know, it's fiber, I'm going to denote it by pi sub phi. It's a finite set of irreducible representations of G. Hence, I get a partition of the irreducible representations of G as a disjoint union of these finite sets called L packets. Okay, so of course I haven't told you what the target is. Right? I just give it a name called L parameters. Okay, so I'm going to define that in the next uh, two or three slides. Okay, to, 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 do, to do that, I need to set up some further notations. So first we have our local field F, right? Uh, take an algebraic closure, F bar, and then of course, you know, you can consider the absolute Galois group, gamma F, Galois F bar over F. Uh, but we are going to consider a variant of it called the V group. How is it defined? Well, it depends on the nature of the local field, whether it is non-Archimedean or Archimedean. Assume first it is non-Archimedean, so p adic field. Okay? Uh, then this, uh, I say it is variant of this gamma f, so it's very closely related to gamma f. In fact, it is a dense subgroup. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you recall, uh, the structure theory of local fields, the absolute Galois group has a certain normal subgroup called the inertial group, IF. And the quotient is uh, generated by so-called Frobenius element, topologically generated. So the quotient is, uh, you know, the profinite completion of Z. Okay? But if you take uh, just the uh, copy of Z inside Z hat, take the pre-image in gamma F, uh, you get a dense subgroup called the Vey group. So anyhow, so you have this Vey group. Uh, well, if f is Archimedean, well, if it is a complex number, wf is just defined to be c cross. If it is a real number, uh, it is basically an extension of z mod 2z by c cross. Okay, so it has a normal subgroup c cross, and then there's another coset with representative j satisfying this relation. So j squared is minus 1, and uh, the conjugation action of j on c cross is just the complex conjugate. Okay, so that defines this uh, V group. And then uh, we define the V the lean group to be uh, or denoted by WD of F to be the V group if F is Archimedean. Uh, if F is P-adic, well, we add a copy of SL2C. Okay, of course, this slide just gives definition of uh, some object without giving any motivation for why you want to consider them. Okay. Uh, all right. But you should, uh, I guess, uh, you should, at the moment, you should just think that the, the reason I'm introducing this thing is so that I can define this target space of this uh, reciprocity map on the previous slide. So in other words, this, uh, what are L parameters? Okay, so the, there's a, that's one ingredient, the vague Delin group. Uh, the other one is this dual group, an L group. Okay, so we have a connected uh, state split reductive group, G over F. And a Langlands associated to it a connected complex V group called the dual group. Uh, how is that defined? Um, well, uh, if you fix a maxima uh, torus containing the Borel subgroup over F, then you can write down um, a root datum. Okay? Namely, uh, XT is the uh, group of characters of T, YT is the group of co characters. And phi and phi hat are the roots and co roots. Okay, so I guess this is these are the basic object in Lie theory. Right? You classify, uh, for example, compact Lie groups by the root systems and so on. Okay. Of course, uh, we have a Borel subgroup, so that actually uh, picks out a set of simple roots and simple co roots. So in fact, we have slightly more data than what I've uh, listed here. In fact, we have a basis for our root system in some sense. So these are called base root datum. Uh, but now. Uh, to define this G hat, you can exchange the row of X and Y and phi and phi hat. So I switch the positions of the first pair with the, with the second pair. I get another quadruple, which is uh, also a, a root system, uh, sorry, a root datum, and that defines uniquely a, a complex B group uh, 
complex reductive group, G hat. Okay. That's the formal <laughs> definition. Now, uh, you know, if your group were quasi split, then the, the Galois group act on this uh, base root datum, and this induces, uh, this gives rise to an automorphism. This gives rise to uh, automorphisms of G hat. And hence, we can define a semi direct product uh, called the L group. So as I said, well, I'm going to just restrict my attention to the case when G is split. In this case, the conjugation action, these automorphisms are all trivial. So in fact, this is a direct product. All right, so uh, I guess I give a, a table listing some examples. So these are the groups that I will talk about in my, uh, in, I guess we will talk about in a course. Okay, so, I, so GLN, the dual group, I guess I changed my notation, it should be a hat here, uh, is GLNC. Right, if it's sp2n, it's so2n plus 1c. See, when you exchange the positions of the act of the roots and co-roots, you exchange the rows of long roots and short roots. So if you have a group of type c, it's dual, it's of type b. And vice versa, over here, um, so2n is just so2nc, g2 is just g2c. So you see, uh, in some sense, nothing much is happening except the types b and c get switched. Okay. Now I can define L parameter. So those are the two ingredients I need. An L parameter is an uh, equivalence class of homomorphism from the Vedalin group to the L group. And this has to satisfy some property. Uh, but before that, what, what, is, what is the equivalence relation here? The equivalence relation is defined by conjugacy by this dual group, uh, G hat. Okay. okay, so some properties uh, is the following. So um, let me see. Yeah. So we, of course, uh, you know, WDF, if you recall, is just a direct product of the V group with SL2, right, in the periodic case. So of course, you have a natural inclusion map from w, WF to WDF, and you compose it with this parameter, and then you can project it onto gamma F. You want this to be the natural map. Okay. At least in the periodic case, we saw there was a natural map, right? Um, because WF was a dense by definition, a dense subgroup of gamma f. So there's a natural inclusion map. You want this composite to be equal to that one. Um, if f a complex number, of course, there's nothing here. So there's no condition. Okay, if f is real number, this is gamma f is almost trivial. It's just a two group. I'll let you imagine what it is. What is this natural map? Okay, now um, some other conditions. Uh, this parameter when restricted to WF should be smooth. Uh, roughly speaking, um, okay, it means that when you restrict to the inertia group, you want it to factor through a finite quotient. Okay? And uh, you want the uh, image to consist of semi-simple elements. So these are some technical conditions. And finally, you want the restriction to the SL2 part to be an algebraic representation. Okay, so in short, an L parameter is a G hat conjugacy class of a local Galois representations value in the complex Lie group. Why? Because I think of this WDF as a variant of uh, the absolute Galois group. Okay? It's very closely related to the absolute Galois group. Uh, and such a thing up to G hat conjugation is a representation. Okay? Um, so let me see. Okay, so I think I, I want to, sometimes I want to think of it as an equivalence class of morphism, sometimes I want to think of it just as a morphism. Okay, so I, maybe I distinguish it by as follows. So uh, I let phi tilde be the set of all maps like that, satisfying these conditions. Okay, but before I take the equivalence class, and uh, if I modulo the G hat conjugacy action, then there is my phi G. Okay, so that defines the L, L parameter. So I have defined now the target space of the local Langlands correspondence. Okay, so the first statement, at least, uh, I think all the objects are defined. Uh, now I come to the second statement of the LLC, uh, which is the following. So of course, your goal is to parameterize rep uh, irreducible representations. This map is uh, just finite to one, right? So which means that you have two elements here. So you, you think of this, the way I like to think of it is that this L parameter is the last name of a representation. So but this map is not injective, so you have, could have two representations with the same last name. And then you cannot tell them apart. But, yeah, but you would like to tell them apart because you like to have a classification. 
Okay. And so in other words, what you need to do is you need to parameterize the fibers. Okay. Of course, the fibers is a finite set. Okay. You can think of, you know, people with the same last name are in the same family. Okay. So family is a finite set of number of people and you would like to, uh, to tell them apart. Okay. So to tell them apart, uh, you need to give them a first name. Okay, so let's imagine we have a, a morphism phi. Uh, then we can consider, so I'm going to explain how you uh, parameterize the fibers. Okay, so you're going to look at uh, the centralizer or the stabilizer. So if you think about it, so g hat acts on this phi tilde of g by conjugation. You take an element in there, of course, uh, you have group action, so you can look at the stabilizer. And the stabilizer is nothing but the centralizer in G hat of the image of phi. So we call that a S sub phi. And uh, now I'm going to consider, so whatever it is, it is some uh, complex algebraic group and I can consider it's a component group, which will be finite. And I'm going to call that A phi. Okay. I guess in a, probably in a lot of articles, for example, by Arthur, he will also, he will denote this uh, component group by, uh, he will also call it S5, but in a different script, okay, which for me is very hard to distinguish the different scripts. So I just give it a different, completely different name, A5, okay, for the component group. Well, there's a natural map from, uh, I mean, the center of G hat, uh, you see, if, imagine the group is split so that the gamma F action on G hat is trivial. Then I can suppress this superscript here. Uh, then what I'm saying is that, you know, the center of G hat, of course, commutes with everything. Okay, you will commute with the image of phi as well. And so there's an actual map to the centralizer, which I can then follow by the projection to the component group. Okay, so finally, uh, now I have the language to state the parameterization for the fibers. Okay, so this is an L packet, and we postulate that there is a bijection from this uh, finite L packet to the set of irreducible characters of A phi, but you know, modulo the image of this uh, the center. Okay. So the, sorry. Oh yeah, this gamma f should be outside. Certainly. Yeah, should be outside. Okay. So of course, uh, you know. Once you know, this is just saying that those, these two finite sets have the same size, that's it, right? But of course, we, you know, there are many such bijections when they are of the same size. So again, you need to specify some properties in order to characterize this bijection. Okay. Okay, uh, we can give a more geometric description. Okay, you can think of the space phi tilde of G as, like a, as a variety uh, equipped with an action of G hat by conjugation. Now, if WDF had been a finitely generated group, for example, if uh, it, it were the fundamental group of, uh, of a Riemann surface, okay, then in fact, uh, this type of uh, situation uh, is what people call a character variety. Now, an L parameter is nothing but a G hat orbit, O phi, right, on phi tilde. Okay, so by the orbit stabilizer theorem, so O phi can be identified with G hat mod E stabilizer. Now, if you give me an element of uh, an irreducible representation of the component group A phi, then it actually, it gives rise, okay, of course it is a representation of the stabilizer S phi. So it gives rise to a G hat equivariant, I guess a failing error, vector bundles on the orbit in the usual way. And uh, this more geometric viewpoint uh, will be relevant maybe in the last uh, two lectures of, uh, uh, of our lecture of this mini course, uh, which uh, Hiraku will, Atobe will, will talk about. Okay, okay so uh, uh, let me uh, flesh out some known results. Okay, when F is Archimedean, the local Langlands correspondent has been known for some time. Uh, since the 70s, I guess, by uh, through the work of uh, many people, uh, I just name a few here. Of course, it's based on the work of Harris Chandra and then Langlands, and uh, maybe Zeb Nap Zuckerman. Okay. Uh, for periodic fields, uh, I guess uh, for G equals to GLN, 
It has been shown by Harris Taylor, Hanyan, and Shokser, each one giving us a different proof okay, over a period of uh, maybe 10 years. Okay. Uh, now, in this particular case, the map, the reciprocity map L, is actually bijective. So, in fact, L packets are singletons. Now, uh, in fact, for this course, we'll be mostly focused on the first two groups here. These are the classical groups, symplectic, orthogonal, and uh, unitary. Uh, observe that uh, I had a uh, written orthogonal group here instead of a uh, special orthogonal group, which, of course, uh, contradicts my convention that G is connected reductive. Okay? But in fact, it's much better to work with this disconnected group. You can make sense of... Uh, the story I tell earlier, um, even for a disconnected group like the orthogonal group. So, uh, of course, this was the, one of the achievements of Arthur to prove the local Langlands correspondence for uh, the first three groups. And then uh, Moglen did a lot of work on this as well. And uh, Mock extended what Arthur did to the unitary to the quasi split unitary groups, and for the non quasi split ones, Kaleta, Minges, Shin, and White completed the story. Uh, I just give a couple of uh, random other examples. Uh, so, MP2N stands for the metaplectic group, which is a non linear two fold cover of SP2N. In fact, one can formulate a local Langlands in this setting too. Uh, so, I did it with uh, Gordon Savin a few years ago, and the other group. Uh, thing I did with uh, Suichiro Takeda was to establish the LLC for GSP4. Okay, and uh, the, let me mention that, uh, of course, uh, some recent ongoing work of uh, Lauren Fox and uh, Peter Schokser provides a general framework and strategy for establishing the LLC in general for through more geometric means, but I'm not sure what the, pro what the status of this is currently. Okay, so this is just a a snapshot of some known results about the LLC, which is to say that it's not just pure fantasy, but there are actually it has been proved in certain cases. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that you have this uh, map and the bijections of the parameterization of the fibers, which should be characterized by some properties. Okay. I want to discuss some of these properties uh, because maybe we'll use it at some point. Okay. Okay, the first uh, is the following. So, of course, we're interested in this set of irreducible representations. Okay, but in there, there were certain special subsets, let's put it this way. Okay, so for example, you, have, uh, you may have a set of unramified representations. Okay, if the group is split, uh, it has a certain canonical uh, maximum compact. Okay, the, the sharp, it's a Chevalet group, it's defined over Z, so you can take a, a ZP points, for example, that gives a canonical, um, rather canonical, maximum compact. And uh, unramified representations are those that have non-zero fixed vectors by such a maximum compact. So that's a certain subset of representations. Um, now, of course, we have the unitary representations which we introduced earlier. And among the unitary representations, there's a certain special class called the tempered representations, which arise in the work of Harris Chandra. Harris Chandra was trying to decompose the regular representation of a Lie group, like L2 of G. And uh, of course, in the case of finite groups, every irreducible representation occur in the regular representation. But for Lie groups, right, uh, semi-simple Lie groups, for example, is not the case. Only a certain subset of the unitary representations appear, and these are the tempered representations. Among these tempered representations, there's an even more special class called the discrete series. That's what the DS stands for. Okay. Those are the ones that appear discreetly in L2 of G. And finally, for a periodic case, there's an even small a special class called the supercuspital representations. Okay. So we have certain distinguished subsets of the irreducible representations. And we want to know, for example, under this reciprocity. So if I apply the reciprocity map to each of these subsets, of course, I get the corresponding subsets of the L parameters. Right? So then the natural question would be, you can ask, is like, uh, how can I characterize these subsets here? If this parameterization is meaningful, then uh, any meaningful objects on this side should have meaningful names. 
right? So that's uh, what uh, we are saying. And then, if so, what are those names? Okay. Okay. So how can we characterize phi dot of g as dot runs over all these potential these different subscripts? Okay. So here are some of the answers. Okay. In the unramified case, so this u r, <laughs> phi is in this uh, is an unramified L parameter if it is trivial on the inertial group and also on SL2C. Okay. Tempered. Phi corresponds to a tempered representation if and only if the image of phi is bounded. Okay. Discrete series. Phi is a discrete series L parameter if and only if the image is not contained in a proper parabolic subgroup of uh, G hat, let's say. Okay. So these are so uh, you know there are this some of these properties like that. Okay, how about the last two, this uh, supercuspiter and unitary, which I have left out. For supercuspiter, um, an answer will be given in uh, Atobe's lecture tomorrow, I think. Okay. Uh, this is not so uh, it's not so clear how to formulate the answer. It's uh, hopefully Atobe will dis will discuss this tomorrow. And uh, in fact, I think the first person to figure out uh, uh, this is Moglen. Unitary. Well, I don't think anyone knows. At least I don't know. This seems to be the problem of the unitary doer, the question of classifying irreducible unitary representations. Right? It's also a basic problem. How do you express the answer in terms of L parameters? Okay. I, uh, I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, I want to come back to the characterizations because I told you there were these maps and it should be characterized by some properties. So I want to give you a, 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 a sense of what those properties might be. Okay, so first, for L. So ideally, we would like to characterize this map L by saying that it respects certain invariants that you can attach naturally to the source and the target of the map. Okay, and what are these invariants? Uh, they are going to be local L functions, or L factors, and epsilon factors. Ideally, we should be able to attach these invariants to an irreducible representation of G as well as to an L parameter. Okay. Now, for L parameters, one can define these uh, L factors quite readily. So, uh, so for example, if you are given an L parameter, okay, and you are given an algebraic finite dimensional representation of the L group, let's call it R. So R is a homomorphism from LG to GLV. Okay. Then, of course, you can compose them because, after all, phi is just a homomorphism from WDF to LG. Right? So, you can compose those two maps. You are going to get a representation, finite dimensional representation of the Vedalin group. Then, we can associate an L parameter for, to this representation of the Vedalin group by the following uh, formula. So, this, is, this formula is a slight extension of what you might. Um, Recognized as the as the local factor artin L function associated to a Galois representation. Right? So I have my representation. I take the if. Uh, uh, no, first I take the. I didn't say what is sub n is. Um, okay, that's my bad. Um, this n is supposed to be the unipotent subgroup of SL two, the upper triangular uh, unipotent subgroup of SL two matrices that look like one x zero one. Okay, and I take the co-invariance uh, of V by that subgroup. Okay, this subgroup is of course normalized by the torus or in SL two, and also by WF. Okay, so I can take the inertia invariance. Now the Frobenius uh, will act on that, uh, as well as this torus element. So I. I write down what is uh, you might recognize as the local factor of RTNL function. Okay, so that's a very uh, you know. So in other words, I'm saying that we can define local L factors for an L parameter. To define the local epsilon factor for uh, L parameter is more uh, tricky. Okay, it's much more involved. It was first figured out by uh, Delin and Langlands, and uh, anyhow, I will skip over that because it's not so easy to describe it. Okay, now what about on the other side, the source of the reciprocity map? Okay, so if we have this, so if now we have a representation pi, and we are given this same r, 
we would like to define a local L factor, Ls pi r. Okay, but so far, only special cases have been done. It's kind of done by a case-by-case -case type of basis. So for example, if pi were generic representation and, uh, of some groups, there was a theory developed by Shahidi, okay, called the Langland-Shahidi method, that defines this invariant. There are many rank, so-called uh, ranking Salbert integrals for various families of L function, but these are mostly done in a rather ad hoc manner. Okay? And, uh, but in the course of uh, Lei Zhang and uh, Jilin Luo, a uh, conjectural general approach due to Braverman Kashtan and further developed by uh, Bao Chao Ngo uh, will be introduced. Okay? So I will leave that to them to talk about this general approach. But the point is, uh, if you imagine that uh, you can attach this invariant, then for example, you would like this L to satisfy this property that if L pi is equal to phi, then the local invariants uh, defined above uh, are equal. Okay? And likewise for the epsilon vector. So this is a, just, this is just to give you a flavor of how one hopes to characterize this map L. Uh, now what about the uh, parameterization of the L pack? Uh, so no, I'm not coming to that yet. Okay, no, I want to come to a, a weaker version because you see, if you, if you have a way of characterizing the map L, the, the map L will give you the partition of irreducible representation of Gs into equivalence classes. The classes being the fibers of the map. Okay, so if you have a characterization of L, you get also a characterization of this partition. Okay. Uh, but you might do something weaker than that, which is to give a characterization of the partition, but without mentioning this reciprocity map L. Okay? And so there's another way of doing this. Uh, this is provided by the theory of endoscopy, which is presumably what this program is about. Um, so it provides a characterization through certain so-called character identities. Uh, so what are these? I'm going to use only one slide, so you shouldn't expect too much. Okay? Firstly, to, uh, if you give me an irreducible representation, Harris Chandra define its character. And uh, which is a G conjugacy invariant distribution on G. Okay? And so instead of being a conjugacy invariant function, because we are in the infinite group setting, it is a distribution. Okay? And this, but just like in the case of finite groups, this distribution uniquely determines pi. Okay, so now, uh, so what are these character identities? <laughs> Suppose you have a tempered L packet. So recall what this means. It means that you have a tempered L parameter, and you look at its pre-image, okay, that's called a tempered L packet. Um, then, of course, it's a finite set of representations. You would like to say that uh, there's a certain unique linear combination there, and actually you can specify which one. Uh, so you can add up this uh, character, so it's like adding up a finite number of functions. Okay, so this is still a G invariant distribution, but you require it to be so-called stably invariant. And then, so you have this distinguished linear combination, right? But you can take many other linear combinations, and some other ones will be equal to the transfers of stable distribution from what are called endoscopic groups. Okay, I leave it to the course of uh, Abhishek Parad and uh, Hasho Kaleta to elaborate more on this slide, because they are going to talk about the stable trace formula, maybe of SL2 or more general groups. So presumably, they have to... Uh, you know, the, the stable here is the same word as the stable, stable there, and presumably they will talk about these concepts. Okay. So I just want to point out that this is another way of characterizing the partition. It is weaker than the giving a characterization of the reciprocity map L, because it doesn't refer to this uh, Galois side at all. Okay. In some sense, to characterize L is to give a characterization of the partition and also the name you give to each uh, the last name you give to each uh, equivalence class. Right? So, um, okay. So that's 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 uh, uh, the end of my discussion of what are L packets. Okay. So I said I'm going to answer an easier question, right? First, what are L packets? So I've done that. Okay. L packets are 
finite sets of irreducible representations, which provide a partition of the irreducible representations of G. So why do I say it's easier to define them? It's because for me, the, their role or their purpose is very clear. They are introduced to, to classify irreducible representations. Okay, so that's a very natural problem. Okay, uh, of course, uh, my goal is still ultimately to, uh, to answer the question, what are L A packets for? Okay, okay so it actually, uh, a packets, the consideration of A packets arise from a global problem. Okay, so now we are going to uh, change our setting to a global setting. What does that mean? I'm going to consider a number few, beta k. It has the ring of Adele's A, right, which is a restricted direct product of uh, kv with respect to this uh, collection of a uh, ring of integers at the non Archimedean v. Again, I take a connected reductive group over my number few. Then I can uh, look at k points and a points. And, uh, GK is a discrete subgroup of uh, GA. Okay, so now the, what is the global question? Just now we had a local problem, right, which is to classify irreducible representations. So you might imagine maybe the, is the global problem the following, to classify the irreducible representations of GA. Um, well, uh, not quite, okay? The reason is because uh, what is GA, right? GA, uh, the dialect points, okay? Uh, can be presented as a restricted direct product of the local groups GKV with respect to a family of maximal compact subgroups. So this was the distinguished family of maximal compact I talked about earlier when G is free. Okay. And as a result of this, an irreducible representation of GA has a factorization as a restricted tensor product. You know, say tensor over pi over v or pi v, where pi v is an irreducible representation of GKV. And what is the restricted mean? It means that for almost all v, for all but finitely many v, pi v has to be a kv unramified. Okay. So, uh, in other words, uh, so okay. So here's one way of. Uh, reformulating what I said above, which is the irreducible representation of GA is, uh, you can think of it as, it's just a restricted direct product of the set of irreducible representations of GKV with respect to the uh, KV unramified ones, okay? Right, because what does it mean to give an element in here? It means that for every V, give me an irreducible representation of GKV, subject to the condition that for almost all V, the representation given should be KV unramified. Given this infinite tuple, I can take the restricted tensor product that produces an irreducible representation of GA, and all irreducible representations of GA arise in this way. So, in other words, uh, the point is to point out that, in some sense, we have already answered this question, classify the irreducible representation of GA, because it is essentially a local problem. If you have solved a local problem of classifying the irreducible representation of GKV, then you know how to build up all the irreducible representations of GA. Okay? So the, in some sense, the above problem has no global contents. Okay? So the, the actual global problem is actually this one, to classify the irreducible automorphic representations of GA. So in the next two slides, I explain what this adjective means. Okay, probably the easiest way, and in fact, one of the, uh, if you want to give a two minute uh, definition of automorphic, the easiest is to say, let's look at the natural unitary representation of GA on L2 GA mod GK. So we said that GK was a discrete subgroup of GA. If G is semi simple, this quotient has a finite volume, it has a natural harm measure, okay, it has finite volume you can look at L2 of this uh, finite volume space. Uh, yes. Yes. Previous. Back. Uh, you mean this? Uh, so this is a notation uh, for, restricted, for restricted direct product. So if I, uh, so for example, okay, um, um, Okay, for example, let's look at this one. This is easier. Right? Suppose I just write GA is a product over V of GKV. 
then you know what it means. It's just you take a bunch of groups, you take the direct product. Okay, but this is not a direct product, it's a restricted direct product. It is a subset, if you wish, of the direct product consisting of all tuples of elements with a constraint. The constraint being that at all but finitely many places, the elements you take has to lie in this subgroup KV. So likewise for, for this. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay, so you can consider the GA act on this L2 space by right translation. Right? And uh, of course, so you have a natural, uh, uh, in some sense, God-given representation, and you like to decompose it into irreducibles. Okay, that's the natural instinct, I guess. Okay, but first you know that by some abstract results or functional analysis, you can decompose this into two parts called the discrete spectrum and continuous spectrum. Okay, because uh, the discrete spectrum, by definition, is the direct sum, whereas the continuous spectrum will be some direct integrals. Let's focus on the discrete part. It, is, it can be written as a direct sum, and one can show, in fact, the multiplicities that every representation appears is actually finite. I mean, that's not, I mean, this has to be shown, okay? And in fact, this discrete part uh, is the most fundamental part. The reason being that the continuous part can be built out of the discrete part of Levy subgroups of G by using the, this is the, the theory of Eisenstein series. Okay, that's the purpose of theory of Eisenstein series. So in this sense, uh, hence, we are going to focus on this discrete part because we, we, we may say that you know, the continuous part can be inductively understood okay, by doing an induction on the size of the group, for example. Okay. We have to understand the discrete part of all groups, of course. Now, the discrete part uh, itself further decomposed into the cuspital part and the residual part. The cuspital part will consist of cups forms, and the residual part is so-called because you can actually exhaust it or construct it by uh, residues of Eisenstein series. Okay. So again, in other words, Eisenstein series doesn't just tell you how to describe the continuous part, it actually describes a bit or a part of the discrete part as well. Okay. So, in principle, we might say that this part is also, you know, can be understood from Eisenstein series, and hence the key part to understand is this cuspital part. Now, so I think the, the easiest way to say what an automorphic representation is, I mean, if you, um, there's a first approximation, you might say that it is just a, consti a, a representation of GA which intervene in this decomposition, especially the discrete part. Okay. You might say that, okay, that, that, that's okay, that's, uh, that's not bad. Okay. okay, but of course there's a proper definition of the space of automorphic forms. It is also a function on GA mod GK that satisfies some smoothness, finiteness, and growth properties. Okay. A cups form is an automorphic form that satisfies the further property that its constant term is zero. Okay, a constant term is defined as such, for every parabolic subgroup, P equals to mn, n being the unipotent radical, I compute a constant term along n, which is given by this integral. I want this to be zero as a function of g. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to let ag be the vector space of automorphic forms, in other words, these guys. And I have a subspace of cups forms, which are those guys that in addition satisfy this condition, the vanishing condition here. And uh, both these spaces uh, are GA modules, okay, in the sense that GA acts on them by right translation. Okay, because if you notice, the conditions are all on the left. Right? All the conditions that are imposed, for example, the left invariance by GK, they are not affected by right translations. Okay. Maybe make a further comment, which is that usually, I guess people also put in a K finiteness condition, which I suppress here. Okay. You can actually talk about smooth mod or automorphic forms. You, you don't really need to work with the k finiteness condition for certain things. Okay. okay, so now here's the formal definition. An irreducible representation of GA is uh, an automorphic representation if it is a subquotient of AG. It is cuspital automorphic if it is contained in here. Okay. And uh, a theory of Langlands 
from Covalis, it says that AG can be built up from the cuspital part of all Levy subgroups of G using Eisenstein series. Okay, so this is like a parallel of the L2 story where and it is saying that the most fundamental part of AG is this A cups G. So I've given a sort of two versions of uh, automorphic representations, one using a L2 theory and one using this uh, AG. Uh, so how are they related? Uh, they are related uh, because, uh, or, or rather, uh, the, these are two different types of functions. The L2 function is not, may not be smooth, a smooth function may not be L2. Okay? So the two spaces are different. But I want to say that their core are the same. The core part of them are the same. What is the core part? The core part is this intersection of AG, the discrete part. Okay? Because for the L2 theory, we say that the discrete part is the fundamental part. Right? The continuous part can be understood once you understand the discrete part. So I take the intersection of these two. Okay, this space is called square integrable automorphic forms. Why? Because I'm looking at automorphic forms which are also in L2. Right? It is a dense subspace of L2 discrete. Uh, which is also called the automorphic discrete spectrum. So these are just two names for the same, for essentially for the same space. So the main problem in a global problem in Langlands program is to describe how the space, the automorphic discrete spectrum, decomposes. Okay. Of course, it is a direct sum because it is the discrete spectrum, so it's direct sum. We want to know how it decomposes. In other words, uh, which irreducible representations occur in it and with what multiplicities. And uh, as I said, this contains the problem of classifying cuspital automorphic representations because, of course, the cups forms is contained in L2, you know, in the discrete part. Okay, and now, of course, this problem is uh, the global parallel or global analog of the local problem of classifying irreducible representations of G that we discussed earlier. Right, so we formulated the local Langlands correspondence then to address that problem. And, uh, and the, so the, 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 the objects we use to parameterize irreducible representations of G in the local setting are these L parameters and so on, right? So you might expect that in view of the local global principle that in the global setting, maybe they are parameterized by global Galois representations as opposed to local Galois representations. And that is... Uh, essentially the case. So let me uh, formulate first the uh, so-called global Langlands correspondence. Now I have to use uh, this uh, group, um, which uh, is not known to exist, and uh, which according from what I learned in the recent Langlands conference in uh, Minnesota, that he may not believe that it exists anymore. But nonetheless, uh, so what is this group? L sub k. It's a group that just depends on the number few k. Okay, it's called the global Langlands group or the automorphic Langlands group. Okay? Uh, but you should think of it as a variant of the absolute Galois group. Okay? So this group is going to play the role of the Vedelin group in the local setting. Okay? It is a variant of the absolute Galois group. Okay. And these two properties here uh, should give you a sense, taste of why uh, this sentence here makes some sense, okay? So first, we, we want a subjective map from LK to the global V group of K. Okay, there is something called the global V group of K, just like the local V group, okay? And uh, we want a subjective map. And in fact, um, we also want the kernel of this subjection to be a, essentially a connected compact group, okay? A connected compact uh, topological group, let's say. Although I didn't write it out here. Okay. Um, okay, so what this means is, for example, suppose you give me a finite order character of LK, okay, say a quadratic character, right? Because a finite order character has to be trivial on the identity component, right? And if, since the kernel of this map is connected, that means that any finite order character will factor through this projection. And hence, it's nothing but a finite order character of the global V group. Okay. Moreover, for every place V of K, there is a distinguished conjugacy class of embeddings from the local group 
the Vedalin group of KV into LK. These are just conditions that you postulate, okay? And as I said, this group is not known to exist. Okay, but the key uh, properties you want of this group is that there should be a bijection called the global Langlands correspondence between irreducible cuspital representations pi of GLN and irreducible n-dimensional representations phi of LK. What is irreducible n-dimensional representation? So it is a continuous homomorphism, right, from LK to GLNC. I'm talking about complex representations here. Uh, of course, I should uh, maybe add more conditions, okay, the conditions like the image of every element is semi-simple and so on. So there are some conditions to, that this uh, representation has to satisfy which mirrors that in the local case. In the local case, when I write down a L parameter, I put down some conditions, okay, like semi-simple image and so on. So I, I want anal analogs of that. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, as you, how will you characterize this bijection? Actually, uh, uh, one of the maybe easiest ways is to characterize it by a local global compatibility. Meaning, so you give me a pi here, right? It can be written as a restricted tensor product. And suppose pi corresponds to phi. Okay, suppose this pi corresponds to this phi. Then I would like pi v, the local component, to correspond to phi composed with i v under the local Langlands correspondence. Okay, what is i v? i v is this distinguished embedding from the local Vedalin group to L k. If I have phi, the n-dimensional representation, I can pull it back to get an n-dimensional representation of this group. That's an L parameter for GLN, so over a local field. So I insist on this local global compatibility for all E, and this should more or less uh, determine this bijection. Okay, so, uh, so that's for GLN. Um, you see, um, you might say this gives a classification of the cuspital representations of GLN. That's, okay, so this is a conjectural classification, similar to the local one. Um, yes, but, uh, you know, and as, you, as we say, the cuspital part is somehow the key part, right? Our problem was to decompose the discrete spectrum, which contains the cuspital part. The cuspital part is the fundamental part, and for GLN, at least this sort of gives you an answer to that. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't address the full discrete spectrum. Okay. Okay, so I want to, so we still need to press on. Okay? We want to decompose the discrete spectrum. And uh, for that, it is convenient to introduce a weaker equivalence relation on irreducible representations. Of course, you have the equivalence, usual equivalence relation to, of isomorphism. But there's a weaker one uh, for representations of the adelic group. We want to introduce that. So we say that two irreducible representations of GA, each pi and pi prime, each one emits this tensor product, are nearly equivalent if pi V and pi V prime are isomorphic for almost all V. Okay. So I, I hope the terminology nearly equivalent is appropriate here because if they are, they are almost easy, if, if pi V were isomorphic to pi prime V for all V, then of course they are isomorphic. Okay, so this is they're almost isomorphic because you only require this local isomorphism for all but finitely many Vs. This is an equivalence relation. Okay? Hence, we can uh, group the constituents of A discrete G into the, these near equivalence classes. So, I will, I can get a, so I'm going to deduce a decomposition of A discrete G into a direct sum of near equivalence classes. In other words, I group the constituents which are nearly equivalent together. Okay? It's an equivalence relation. So now the problem becomes uh, two parts. Okay? But our, our goal is still to decompose A discrete G. Right? But you see, the point is how, how do you formulate your answer? Okay? That's not clear how you formulate the answer. Uh, from this point of view, we can break the problem up into two parts. The first part, the blue part, is to find a meaningful indexing set for the near equivalence classes. Okay. I'm summing, so this one is a near equivalence class, it's indexed by some symbol called psi. Okay. But I mean, I didn't tell you what it is. Okay. So we want to find a meaningful indexing set. 
And then for each side, I have to tell you what this module is. Okay, this could be reducible. Okay, I have to tell you how, what are the representations that occur in it, with what multiplicities. And uh, that is the goal, purpose of Arthur's conjecture. Okay, Arthur's conjecture formulates an answer to the above two problems. And uh, it is in trying to formulate an answer to these two problems that the notion of A parameters uh, arise. Okay. Okay, we might go for five more minutes, then we will take a break. Okay, so, uh, so what's an A parameter? You see, it's something like an L parameter. Okay? But it's first we consider global, because our problem is global. So a global A parameter for G it's a homomorphism from LK cross SL to C to the L group of G. Of course, there should be some conditions, just like in the local case I mentioned earlier. Okay, I have suppressed this. Now, uh, so the point to take note is that there's an extra SL to C here. Okay, we're going to call that the Arthur SL two. So I mentioned just now that for every place V, right, there's a distinguished conjugacy class of embeddings from the local group LKV to LK. And LKV is just the Vedalin group. So if you take a p adic place, the, the local Vedalin group is the V group cross SL2C, right? But this SL2C here is an extra one. Okay, so if you pull back this parameter to the local Vedalin group at a periodic place, it will be a homomorphism from the V group of that local field cross an SL2C and cross this other SL2C. There will be two SL2C present. To distinguish the two, I will call the first one the Delin SL2 and this one the Arthur SL2. Okay. Anyhow, that's what an A parameter is. Uh, okay, some terminology, we say that there are two such things are equivalent if they are conjugate by G hat. Um, we say that they are nearly equivalent if for all, hmm, I guess I mean for almost all, okay, because I want nearly, right? For almost all V, ah, uh, no, let me see. Do I want almost all? Maybe I want, no, indeed, I mean for all. I would like to say for all, yes. This may look a bit suspicious because, uh, okay, I want to say they are nearly equivalent if so actually, maybe this is not a good term. It's better to use the term locally equivalent or something like that. Okay. For all V, I can pull back these parameters by the embedding IV, right? Then I'm going to get two maps from here. Uh, well, anyhow, IV was this embedding here. Okay. And then suppose that for all V, the pullback parameters are conjugate. I'm going to call them nearly equivalent. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I know that now it's a, uh, maybe, a, as I said, maybe a more appropriate name are, they are locally equivalent or something like that, or locally conjugate. Uh, the reason why is because, um, yeah, so, uh, okay, I'll make it clear the next slide. But, but of, of course, you may say that, you know, I can try to define a local of, uh, a notion of nearly equivalent, where I put for almost all V here. Okay, that's fine. Maybe that will make everyone happier because they see the almost all and they say, oh, it's nearly. Okay, that's true, but I think there's not much difference between the two uh, notions. Uh, it's just because it's something like this. If you have a global Galois, a two global Galois representation, right? And if they are locally conjugate for almost all V, in fact, they are, um, now, okay, so, no, never mind, let me not go into that. This is my definition. The name may not be appropriate. Of course, you can, uh, as I said, you can insert this almost all. And in fact, maybe it's better to do that. Let's put almost all. That will make everyone happy, I think. Okay, so I, let me change. Say that they are nearly equivalent if for almost all V, the following holds. Okay? Uh, finally, uh, we say that it's elliptic if the image is not contained in a parabolic. Okay, and we denote the set of equivalence classes of elliptic A parameters by psi sub elliptic G. Okay. We say that psi is tempered or generic if 
psi restricted to this arthur SL2C is trivial. These are just some names uh, or adjectives given to some specific class. Okay, and uh, as we saw, given an A parameter, we can look at its local component, which is the pullback of phi by the embedding IV. It's got above. And we are going to call that the local A parameter. Okay, I think I will take a break here because it's 10.30 and uh, we will reconvene at 11 o'clock, if I'm not wrong. Okay, and we will just go on. Uh, I'm almost at the notion of local A packets because uh, we have defined the parameters. <laughs>